In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Amen. Mary, Mother of God, Amen. pray for us Christ. sinners now Amen. and at the hour Amen. of our death. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Risen indeed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is Timothy S. Flanders. You are watching The Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Meaning of Catholic contributor Kenny Hall and the Bitcoin guru himself, Eric <laughs> Sammons. Eric, how you doing, brother? I'm doing well. I didn't Excellent. expect to be introduced like that, but that's cool. I'll well, take you it. You are the only one here who wrote a book on Bitcoin called that's Bitcoin right. Basics. That's right. Check it out, ericsammons.com. And it's interesting because the book is a lot of it is a primer on economics and money and the meaning of money. So it does tie into tonight's topic. Perfect. So take a look at that. And is that is that on sale to all viewers uh, in Bitcoin? No, I'm uh, just, you okay. actually can buy it from my website using Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, and, uh, yeah, well, you're, you're really putting it. your money where your mouth is. If yeah, or you can buy it from uh, Amazon <laughs> with you know fiat currency. But you know, however oh, you okay, want to. Okay, do it. okay, okay, great, great. Okay, well, we tonight's show is part one of the Catholic traditional masculinity series. Uh, that's because. Mr. Kennedy Hall is releasing this book, Terror of Demons, Reclaiming Traditional Catholic Masculinity. And what we're doing is we're, we're going to do a number of shows on traditional Catholic masculinity um, from both the spiritual angle to the practical, emotional, physical, whatever. Um, on Monday, we're going to do a show on strength training, uh, physical lifting. What does that mean? Why is that important for masculinity? Um, and we're going to be creating a website that's going to go along with this book and that's going to have all these online resources that's going to help you. And so part of this has to do with the duties of a man, which are uh, taken out. Here's Prumer. The duties of a man are the husband is obliged as head of the family to guide his wife, children and servants to provide for his wife and family sufficient food, clothing and maintenance. And three. To administer family property wisely. So I always I always forget to leave my servants though. I need to. Yeah, need to remember you really got to get on that. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you not leading your servants, Kennedy? Should have had uh, one of them light your pipe at the beginning. Come on. <laughs> well, he's busy shining my shoes. I mean, you oh, can't you can't overwork your servants. Oh, okay, okay. So, so uh, Eric, I want to ask you, um, what is what is so important about as a man managing your property wisely? Why is that so important? Uh, how does that rank to you, Eric? I think it's uh, vitally important because in one hand, it gives peace to a household, first of all. Because if you're stressed out about money, about your possessions, about the things around you so much, you're less likely to be a peaceful head of the household. Right. Your wife is going to be naturally and and uh realistically she's going to be anxious and she should be <laughs> if you're not managing your property your your money wisely uh you're not going to be able to necessarily support your children in ways that you should perhaps their education uh in different ways especially today where uh, catholic education can be expensive college and 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 or even uh lower grades uh and, and just there's so many ways in which a household the goal, of course, is to have this calm, peaceful household. And there's a lot of ways that, a lot of things that contribute to that. And I think properly managing your finances is a very key piece. In fact, I, I remember, I can't remember on the details now, but I know that the vast majority of divorces, there is a financial element behind it. And of course, that's the extreme. But I think even if we're not talking as extreme as divorce, even just having a peaceful household with a good relationship with the husband and wife requires a, a, a controlled finances that are that are managed well. And, and so that I think it really does, it's a foundational level thing for a uh, leading a household, being the head of a family is having your personal finances in order. Excellent. Yeah, uh, you wanna jump in on that, Kennedy? Any comments? Yeah, I think uh, money is its kind of like physical health. It's one of those things that is a, a magnifying glass <coughs> on the your general virtual, your virtue setup in your life. So, I mean, if you're not good with your, 
eating habits, with your sleeping habits, with your drinking habits, etc. Those things kind of are a result of that you don't have your you don't you're not living a virtuous life. You don't have your appetites under control, etc. So when your money is not in, under control, it doesn't mean you're rich. I mean, you know, things happen and, and whatever. But if it's not under control in a reasonable way, it means that you're going to have other defects. So you can't control what you're spending it on, which means you don't have self control. Um, you can't reasonably work out a, a budget with your wife, which means you don't have good communication in your marriage. So by fixing that element in your marriage, or even just your personal life, if you're single. It's a magnifying glass and all the other things you have to work on that are an impediment to getting that under control. So it's kind of a good, even it's even just a good exercise to do for your own peace of mind. Look at your finances because it forces you to ask a lot of hard questions and take a lot of hard steps that you need to in order to be virtuous. Yeah, I love that. That's great. I, I put out a tweet before the show talking just about the historical circumstances that have led us to where we're at now. Because a big part of it was when the Industrial Revolution separated the family so that the man then went out of the household to go work in a factory. And then he was given money that he could have for himself away from the family, which led to a lot of drinking. And this is what spurned on the temperance movement. Sometimes in America, we, we sit around and we're thinking... Wow, they actually Ill they actually made drinking illegal in this country. And that's just kind of crazy to think about. But the reason for that was because all these women were at home trying to take care of some kids while dad was off boozing. Yeah. And so there was a strong feminist reaction to this, which was justified in some way, because obviously these men are this effeminate. They're not taking care of business. They're not taking care of their families. And so the women are trying to step into provide injustice what is necessary for themselves and their children. And so this situation arises. Um, but in, in traditional Catholic mor moral theology, the woman does have a right to stay home with the kids and give the kids their right, which is their mother. Yeah. And so our job as men is to provide as much um, income that is necessary to provide this peaceful home, provide the security and provide for the rights of our wife and children to the wife to not work or work at home uh, if necessary. So um, how do we do that in this day and age? That's what we're going to try to answer in this episode, try to get into some practical things. We wanted to discuss usury uh, as it regards personal finances. Now, hopefully we can convince Eric to come on again and defend libertarianism and uh, Keynesian economics or whatever. Um, uh, no, no, I'm against Keynesian. Oh, economics. okay, okay. <laughs> come on, that's that's the devil. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Come I'm on. sorry. I, hey, that buddy. was a little, little slip of the tongue that I put the yeah. devil in between with you. <laughs> but, Libertarianism uh, sounds like paradise right now, though, compared to uh... <laughs> well, yeah, it is getting a little more attractive <laughs> these days, isn't it? So yeah. yeah, so we we will hopefully, well, God willing, we'll have another show that's a lot more macro in terms of the politics, in terms of the common good, and that type of thing, and so, casual social teaching. But we really want to talk about how does this have to do with personal finances it's really the bottom line is the i mean the, the basic one of the basic principles what is is to avoid as much as possible to be to suffer from usury or to suffer from debt just in, in itself so i wanted to quick discuss some points on what usury is um and eric may have some counterpoints i don't know what he's got up his sleeve but um basically switch plate so, <laughs> I think we're, we're not in person here. So usury, I would say, is probably the most universally condemned social practice yeah. in the history of the church in terms of social, economic, society, common good, those types of issues. Um, it is still a grave sin. The new catechism still condemns usury. Um, but the problem is usury is very complex because it has to do with contracts. It has to do with uh, money and different areas of justice. Uh, within a contract. And so there is a, I would argue that there is a spectrum of orthodoxy within the question of usury. Um, we need to all agree that usury in itself, sort of in the abstract, is wrong because what it basically is, it's saying my neighbor is in need and I want to profit from his need, basically. The basic idea that makes you. Yeah. Usury is basically defined, it's a charge on a loan a just title. What is a title? A title is a right to something in a contract. And so it's charging something without 
you're just right. Now, the encyclical on this is from 1745, mm -hmm. but it, it does explain that in the intrinsic title of, there is no such thing as a just intrinsic title, meaning you're just going to charge, you're just going to charge interest on the loan itself just for the sake of the loan itself. Whereas he does explain that there are extrinsic titles, which are things such as um, you are you needed to invest that money or you need to sustain your workers or certain things of that nature. Um, so Prumer explains that he says, quote, under modern conditions, there are nearly always extrinsic titles, i.e. loss of investment income to justify the taking of reasonable interest, end quote. And so the, the idea what there, there has for many centuries, in fact, been an approved reasonable interest, which was an extrinsic title to a loan. So right. there's the Mons Pietatis, which has been approved by the church in ecumenical councils for at least 500 years, which was a charitable organization, which gave out to the poor loans at a small rate of interest. And that the small rate of interest was an extrinsic title because it was meant to just uh, take care of their staff because they needed to have some sort of profit to take care of their staff to do all the all the lending and everything. Now, by contrast, you have the Jews and other usurers who were charging thirty percent plus interest on these loans, which were which were intended to basically just get rich off poor people, and that's why usury is wrong. But when we transfer this over to our modern context, we see that having a checking account. So here's our personal finance. You have a checking account with 3% interest. Well, that is a just title. And the reason is because every year your money, your money is losing its value by about 3%. And so you have a just title to maintain your own property. You have a just, you have a right to your own property. You're losing, if you don't get any interest on your money, you're going to just lose money. Your, your money is just lo being lost by inflation. So 3% interest is basically a just title. So that's not, you're not being a usurer by that. Whereas um, on the other hand, you have, so recently Wall Street Journal reported that dealerships make more money on just financing and loans than they do on actual sales of vehicles. Yeah. Um, in 2008, the economic crisis, among other things, the, ba the basic cause of it was that mortgage companies were selling out all these loans to these people who couldn't really pay it back. And so then they all defaulted on their loans. Well, basically that's kind of an, an I, that's kind of a example of usury because they're, they're basically just trying to take advantage of more and more people to try to make more and more money without this sort of just title. They're not just trying to get their, their, you know, sort of a reasonable profit basically. So all this is arguable. And um, so, but St. Thomas does, does uh, stipulate that suffering usury is not a sin. If we need to suffer usury because we're in need, it's not a sin. Um, but, and we're going to get into this, and I, I want Eric, you can comment in just a second. Um, but uh, basically, we, we want to avoid being a, a victim of usury. And if we have to go into debt, um, the best the best example of this is really a mortgage. Um, now, over a 30-year mortgage, you might pay back. 30% in interest over, over 30 years, uh, which is quite a lot. But um, there's really no other way to get a home than a mortgage. Um, I don't know if Canadians have figured something else out with their grants. Yeah, we have igloos. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but, here, but the kicker here, though, is because I, I mean, I would say that credit cards or payday loans and that type of thing, credit cards especially, I mean, 50% of Americans are in credit card debt. Um, and credit cards especially charge something like 20, 30% flat, flat interest. And so that I would count that as more usury because it's an unreasonable amount. But the problem is you can't really buy a house unless you have credit. So you have to basically have a credit card, um, and use it a little bit because otherwise you won't have credit. So those are, those, that's what I have to say on usury. Eric, what do you, what do you say? Well, a couple things. And that is, there is a problem with how usury is often defined. I mean, I was doing a little bit of research for this and like, you know, the first medieval definition of usury was back in 806. And it was just defined as where more is asked than is given. 
-hmm. And then later it starts to get more specific where it talks about whatever is demanded beyond the principle. The biggest issue from an economic standpoint with the common understanding of uh, uh, teaching against usury is it doesn't take into effect, it doesn't take into um, consideration time preference. And that is the idea that if I offer you, let's say there's no inflation and we know there's not going to be inflation for the next 10 years. We just know zero inflation magically is going to happen. But I said, I'll give you a hundred, a thousand dollars today, or I will give you a thousand dollars 10 years from now. Everybody rationally will take the thousand dollars today, even if there's no inflation, because you can do things with that thousand dollars. Now you have now opportunities over the next 10 years to use that thousand dollars to potentially buy things you might need to invest in something, invest in a business or do whatever. It's worth more today than it is 10 years from now. So even without inflation, now with inflation, it becomes worth even more for obvious reasons, because a thousand dollars 10 years from now is actually literally worth less than a thousand dollars because yeah. of inflation. But even without inflation, it's still worth less because of the fact that it's later in time, because you can do things with that money. Everybody would want a thousand dollars today rather than 10 years. Now switch it around to the, the uh, person giving out the loan. If he says, I will give you a thousand dollars today, and in 10 years, you have to give me a thousand dollars back. Well, he has gotten the raw end of that bargain because he has gotten something less 10 years from now than he would, than he gave away today. So when it's, when usury is defined very generically as where more is asked than is given, it's actually not true that in 10 years, a thousand dollars is worth the same. It's actually worth less. Yeah. So it is just from the perspective of the, uh, the, the lender to say, I want a thousand and one hundred dollars or whatever in 10 years. There's nothing in my mind, there's nothing unjust about that because a thousand dollars today is not the same good as a thousand dollars 10 years from now. They're actually different. They have different values just objectively. And therefore it's okay to ask for that. Now, I think that just kind of makes sense. And so, it, it just the idea of just interest or some type of charge for a loan, I think just makes sense and 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 falls in justice because of that. Mm -hmm. But I would even go further, and this one might be pushing a little bit, I admit. I even think it's theoretically possible to have a 30% interest loan that can be just. And why do I say that? Let's say you have a situation where you have a deadbeat, somebody who has been terrible. They've never paid back their loans. They're just, they, they, they don't really keep a job. They're just somebody who is maybe they're 40 years old and the last 20 years of life, they've just lived in a dissolute fashion. And, but now they said, I need, I want to get back on track, I, but I need a loan, some type of credit in order to get back on track. Well, if I'm a lender, I see that guy and I think, okay, I give this guy a loan. It's very high risk for me. I have a very good chance he's not going to pay me back. So I could I have two options. I simply say, okay, I, I'm not going to give you a loan because it's just too high risk. Or I say, I'm going to take the risk, but in order to compensate for this high risk, I'm going to give you a high interest rate of 30%. Let's say I'm just making up that number, but let's say he decides because of course a lender is going to do this on a macro level of maybe 10,000 people all with poor yeah. credit and stuff like that. So what he's doing, he's trying to spread out that risk and he's saying, okay, I'm going to give this loan to a thousand high risk people all at 30%, right. knowing that a decent percent of them will default on the loan. I'm going to lose all my money on that one. And so I need to make it up with these other ones. So I would even say in that situation, it could be theoretically possible that even a high interest loan like that is just. Now, I'm talking about justice also. I'm not necessarily talking about charity either. For example, if in charity, your brother who has lived this life has needs some money to get started, doesn't mean you have to charge him 30% interest because he's your brother. And maybe you decide I'm going to give him some type of loan at some rate. And, and, you know, we're not always just trying to keep strict justice. So that's my very short defense <clears throat> of being able to charge interest, even at high rates in certain circumstances. Now, you know, you mentioned the, the, the crisis of 2008. 
And that was very much government driven, pushing these banks to give loans to people who shouldn't pay them. We're getting now into speculation more than we are into loans into interest, because right. really that's that's what happened was these banks are just shoving these and pressuring. I mean, people, you could walk into a bank and barely even sign your name and they give you three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, I remember early around 2000, I was going for a, a, a mortgage and this is before it got that bad, but still it was getting there. And they were willing to give me, I think, twice as much as I was willing to take on. Right. And that's when we'll get into personal finances, is that I realized before I went to the bank, I said to myself, what's the loan amount, the mortgage amount that is feasible for me with my income, my, my situation, my state of life? And I decided that before I went in and I and I went to them, to the bank and they said, oh, we'll give you a loan for this much. And it was literally twice as much as I thought was reasonable, which just shows that the bank is now engaging in in Vegas, you know, roulette, basically. And they're not really anymore being a bank that is using real money. They're just throwing money out there because why? One reason is they know they've got the backing of the federal government. The federal government's going to give them uh, bailouts are going to, I mean, they're incentivized to do this. They're incentivized. The bank is actually, I'm not saying they're not to blame at all, but I am saying that the incentives in the system have been set up at that time. So banks would give out these crazy loans to people. I mean, if, if I had taken on the maximum loan, let's say I bought a house for that maximum loan, it would have crushed my family financially. There's no way, especially once, because what would have happened is I would have bought a house for twice as much money. And then five years later, the market tanked and all of a sudden now I'm underwater because I have this huge loan, this huge mortgage out for a house that's worth less than my mortgage. And so the incentives were all messed up. And so as to take it back to our, our, our main point tonight, as a Catholic father of my family, husband to my wife, I told myself, no, I don't care what the bank says I can take out. I need to take out what I think is reasonable so that if something happens, I, I'm, I'm in a good situation. If something, I lose my job, market tanks, whatever happens, I'm still in a situation where I'm not in a financial disaster situation. I didn't maximize to get as much as I could. So I went there from defending usury to <laughs> going to personal finance. That's, that's great. I just, I wanted, just wanted to read one point from Prumer and then uh, Kennedy want, wanted to have your take on the usury stuff. Uh, but this is from Prumer again, which I think accords with what Eric you're saying here. Prumer says, it is permissible to stipulate for more than the legal rate of interest if there is a just and proportionate title to justify this. And then he's making reference to the old co code of canon law. And then he says further, what amount of interest is reasonable cannot be determined with math mathematical precision, but must be decided from considering the risk involved, the loss of profit, right. et cetera. There you go. So there's really no, uh, there's, that's why the church does condemn usury, but the church cannot give a specific, it's like the, it's a little bit like the just wage. You, you cannot give a specific exact dollar amount or interest percentage amount for every single case, because we already have this moving table of inflation and we also have the local context the different context so there's so many different variables and it's so difficult to stipulate one thing but kennedy go so ahead. I, yeah i agree i mean it's really just strictly kind of a matter of justice and that um whether you want to call it free enterprise or whatever i mean people that are making a, a deal a contract with one another they've got to make a decision about what they're comfortable with the people that are running the business they have to make a decision about what they're going to have to do stay open especially on something like a 10-year loan i mean if you're charging 30%, it's 300 bucks, I guess. That's before we get into the APR type interest. But nonetheless, I mean, you have to you have to plan to be open for 10 years <laughs> in order to receive the rest of it back. So that's what so operating costs have to be taken into account, which that makes sense. Um, I think one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons why the church is so strong on usury is because like I said at the beginning, it is a magnifier for virtue and for vice. Um, so for someone to get to the point where they're like, I mean, think about, uh, when you went in for your loan and I had a similar experience. I think I was, it was 2008. So I was uh, 20 years old and, um, but I went in to get like a student line of credit and I was looking for like a few thousand dollars and they were like, Oh, you can give you 15 or 20. And I was like, Whoa, I thought you might, I thought you were going to say, we'll give you like two or three. And anyway, I settled on a way lower amount because I knew I wouldn't have been able to handle the, the more. But and then about two months later, the crash happened because this was actually in like September of 2008. 
And then good timing. Yeah. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have gotten it two months yeah. later, but <clears throat> anyway. Okay. But my only thing with, um, so Eric, when you're talking about the 30%, now, would you look at that in the way that we look at an annual percentage rate? Um, or do you mean 30% total over the life of the loan or that the total of that interest has to be paid on that balance every year? Because then the amount gets a lot higher. Just what's your opinion on that? I mean, I think it, whatever is financially makes sense for the two parties okay. in the sense that if the lender, they believe that assuming they've done a fair and just uh, actuarial tables of what's their likelihood of getting repaid and, and they've studied all that, which these bank, most banks do, I would say whatever works for them is essentially just if that is basically they realize, okay, in order to give this loan to this person who is right. so high risk, the only way I can do that is if I charge maybe 30% a year even, because if right. I don't, I'm going to probably take on more risk than I'm willing to take because the other option is remember he simply the lender doesn't give out the loan and then in which case okay now the guy who's high risk he's just out of luck and maybe he needed that loan to you know start a business that he needed or whatever I mean whatever the case may be he needed that right. loan to get going now obviously there's always in a in a just and good society he should be able to go to charity and you know to the church and hopefully he'll get some support there but I would say any and that's why I would just say there's never, I would never put a number on what is a just interest rate and things like, and how you would do it. I would think it would depend very much on the scenario of the individual. So, so what would you say just hypothetically, like what's an industry where you can look to that industry and say, generally speaking, it's a usurious approach in today. I'm just wondering what you think. I mean, I, I, I would probably say I can't think of any right now, but I would say in the in the uh, build up to the 2008 crash, mm -hmm. I think you had a situation in which you literally had banks pressuring people to take right. on more loans than they could, and that's what I mean. That's what happened to me mm -hmm. is that not only did they say we can give you double what you're asking for, they tried to get me to, right. they tried to pressure me to do that. That seems to me usurious because now it's a situation where you are trying to make me more of a debt slave than I really need to be. You are trying to take advantage of the idea of I can give you all this free money when it's really not free money. And I think a lot of times you saw practices in the banking industry where they would almost purposely keep secret, almost not technically secret, but they keep it very low key, all the different uh, uh, consequences of that. So you get somebody who's not well educated in finance, mm -hmm. who is uh, perhaps not been brought up well in understanding personal finance. They don't have a lot of money. They don't understand these contracts. And all of a sudden they just signed on for something. They had no idea what they just signed on for. I was told, say, are you talking about the person who works at the bank or the, the lender or the person getting the lend? The I'm talking about the, the loan office. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. The person getting the, the loan. I was just joking. Yeah, yeah. And the lender, sometimes they don't either. Yeah. But they, they, they go in and say, oh, yeah, we can get you. And they start showing, telling them, you can get a $200,000 house when yeah. really the person can afford only for maybe an $80,000 house. Right. But they see a $200,000 house, like, wow, that'd be great for the kids. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand necessarily. And, and there's a responsibility on the individual, too. Don't, don't get me wrong. Yes. Obviously, that person. But taking advantage of somebody <laughs> who doesn't understand the finances of it in order to get a higher loan amount and something the person can't understand I don't know if that's technically defined as users, but to me, it's definitely unjust. It's, it sniffs of it. Like, yes. I, I was thinking um, when I, you know, when I was a freshman, we don't say freshman in Canada. We say first year. When I was a first year university student, um, there was just like Capital One and whatever, all the credit card companies just had booths. Right. And it's like, you're automatically approved for a $1,200 limit or something. And um, I didn't, end up, I had a different credit card. But the point is, I remember thinking like, I went back, I did my first part of university, took some time off, went back as like a 24 year old. And I'm sitting in class with a bunch of 19, 20 year olds who seemed like children to me at the time I was getting married and they were all partying and whatever. And, uh, I remember thinking, wow, like most of you, uh, are going to go and probably go on a vacation to Cuba or wherever, uh, Mexico on, on spring break and not pay that back and carry around this weird little $1,200 debt that you're going to end up paying 5,000 total by the time you pay it back. 
And all of the booths knew that when they got right. you to sign up. Right. Now, maybe the person who was working there who was just another university student right. was just whatever, I'm signing names for Capital One. But I remember thinking about that now and looking at it going, yeah, that seems like basically a pretty strong temptation to catch people in sort of a gotcha moment financially. Yeah, and I think I think the banks definitely have a certain responsibility when they're trying to attract those people in those situations. But it, what one thing it also does is it it reminds us of the importance as Catholic fathers to right. teach our kids. So when they because I have three who are already out of the house, two are in college still, and one is actually graduated from college, to teach them as before they leave the house, understand when you see that free twelve hundred dollars at that booth, it ain't free. Yeah. And so you need to understand that, that you're being taken advantage of. So there's on both sides, there's a responsibility, a responsibility on the lender side to not try to take advantage of people who are not knowledgeable, a responsibility on the Catholic father side to make sure your, your kid does understand your responsibilities and, and the consequences of these, of these loans. Yeah. So l let's get into the, the personal finance at this point. Um, we talked a little bit about debt sort of in general as opposed sort of debt as an umbrella term wherein usury is one of the debts but debt could just be you know totally legitimate debt uh, but there's so many different debts you've got the mortgage you got the car loan you got the school loans you've got what else you got so many different loans credit cards. take out credit cards um i already mentioned that um it's, I mean, it's hard to get a mortgage often if you don't have some credit card where you've paid it off and you have some credit established. Um, but let's talk about some basic, what I want to do here is for this part, I just want to talk about what are some basic principles that you live by, mm -hmm. um, the basic fundamental principles, and then that'll probably go into ways to budget because um, we all need to have a budget. I don't know how you can do it without a budget, um, but there's different methods to do that, of course. And then I want to talk about savings, investments, and we can talk about specifics like mortgage, car loans, college, health insurance, and specific ways to do that. So, um, Kennedy, what what would you say? What are some of your basic fundamental principles for personal finance as a Catholic father? Uh, first thing, <clears throat> because hey, we all come at this from different. Some of us are raised well with money habits, some of us aren't, and we all just find our way where we are now. So you've got to take care of your situation. So if you've got debts, well, you got them, so you got to sort them out. Um, so the first thing is to uh, be current with all your bills. Um, that seems really uh, that seems really like an afterthought, but it's not because the sixty dollars here, the fifty dollars there, the cell phone bill, the cable. I mean, I don't have cable, but internet bill. I mean, these little things. I mean, each month it's about let's say five to eight hundred dollars of these kind of little bills, especially if you have kids and their own plans and all that kind of stuff. If you get behind those things, which you shouldn't, because they're not big each month, but if you get behind two or three months, it's like all of a sudden. You've got to find twenty eight hundred dollars or something, which is then you're in a pickle, and you you would have spent that money on something silly anyway. So being current with all of your bills and making that a priority is really good. It also gets rid of that anxiety that Eric was talking about, because you don't. It's kind of like when you don't have your homework done, uh, or you don't have your work done. And it's like you know you should, but you'll just leave it. You just know it's there, and you're not going to have peace of mind until it's done. Um, having an emergency fund. Basically, if anyone knows who Dave Ramsey is, I'm kind of just giving you the little elevator pitch of what he says. Having an emergency fund, um, that'll depend on your state and life, but a thousand bucks is a pretty good start. I mean, if you've got your basic uh, insurances, which is probably another one I would say, um, look into uh, the, the useful insurances. Um, I guess in the States, you guys have medical insurance. Um, we have our health care, but Still a lot of the stuff we have to get insurance for, dental and eyes and benefits for physio and whatever you need, um, drug plans. Make sure that those basic things, and when you are looking for your insurance plans, um, I would say be prudent with what you're shopping for. So for example, I was looking at what it would be like to get a insurance plan for my family for something else. And uh, there was like an 80% coverage option and a 100% coverage option. And the price each month was a difference of about, you know, like 80 to 120 bucks, depending. And they tried to really sell, okay, get the 100% coverage option. It was for a drug plan. But I remember thinking, okay, what are, the, what are the odds of these sorts of drugs needed in my family, et cetera? No one's sick at the moment. Um, and it was very unlikely I would ever need 
the hundred percent to afford the things. And I remember thinking if I'm in a position where I can't afford that 20%, then I've got other problems uh, going on in my life. So I thought it was actually more prudent to do the 80% when I was, when I was weighing it out. So get current with your bills, have an emergency fund and make sure your basic, I would say kind of like catastrophic insurance things are covered. That might be different depending on where you live. Um, you know, so that you have to decide that. And then once you've got those three things figured out, uh, then I would say start putting away your your basic rainy day fund. Try to have, you know, three months or so of your living expenses and savings in case you lose a job, et cetera, things like that. Um, yeah, and then beyond that, we can get into investments and, and that sort of thing. But I think those those three or four things are good starting points because kind of no, no matter what happens, you'll have a buffer and you'll be safe for a little bit before you, so you can get back on your feet and keep peace of mind in your home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric, what, what do you have on fundamentals? Yeah, some similar things. I think uh, I am, I've always been very anti debt. Yeah. And definitely credit card debt. I remember when I was a, in high school, my dad uh, had me get a credit card so I could start building up credit. It was like a $500 limit, and he was the co signer on it and everything. And I can't remember now if he actually explicitly told me or if he just let me believe it. I thought you had to pay off your however you owed every month or else the credit card would be canceled. That's and perfect. he never let me know otherwise. <laughs> and so awesome. it was literally years before I found out that you didn't have to pay <laughs> the entire amount that you that you used it for. And so which was a great habit for me because from the time I first started using it in high school, I thought – and I got into the habit of always paying off. So never, ever, ever don't pay off your credit card debt every month. Uh, now, here's actually a more recent story. So I use a credit card to pay most of my expenses now, and I always pay it off every month. I do it so I can get bonuses and things like that. And for years, I didn't even have a credit card. I didn't even use one for a long time. After I'd already gotten a mortgage and everything, I dropped all my credit cards, didn't use it. But then about two years ago, I said, okay, I'm going to start using these credit cards but only I'll pay them off every month. Two months ago, I made a typo in my bill pay of 20 cents off. I paid 20 cents less than the total amount. I got a total of $50 in charges. interest charges yeah. because I didn't, because I was 20 cents off. Now I called up the credit card company. They're very understanding. I said, yeah, it's obviously a typo. We'll wait, we'll credit those charges. Right. But it tells you how important it is to pay off your entire credit card bill every month. And another thing we did was, and this is a, a principle, and because I know everybody's in different situations, live off of one income. Mm -hmm. So when I first got married, my wife had some student debt. I had a little bit of student debt. And what we did was we used her, in, and she had a job, I had a job. We used her entire salary Every, every dime that, she, that was brought in on her salary and we sent it to the, the, the student, pay off the student loans early. And so we would knock down that principal. And we had our first child a year and a half, I think it was, after we were married. And literally the month before, I guess it was two, actually two months before our first child was born, I made the final payment on our final student loan. Mm. And so we were debt free when the baby was born and we had been for a year and a half living off of my income. And so when she stayed, when she, when she had the baby stopped working outside the home, of course she working and taking care of our child, but she quit her job, had the baby. There was a completely smooth transition, right? Because not only did we not have any debt, but we were living off of my income already. And when I, you know, this is my first job out of college. I'm not making a lot of money. And we just, and we were living in a apartment that was basically the upstairs of a house and very small and everything. But we're like, okay, we, we have to live uh, very frugally, didn't take trips or anything like that because we knew we had this, we had this student loan debt we wanted to pay off. And so we were renting at the time. So it was a great thing when our first child was born, we had absolutely no debt and we were living off one income. So I'd say the, the fundamentals I, I, I kind of glean from that is always pay off all, you know, like you were saying, Kennedy, pay off everything in time, but pay your full amount of anything you owe. So mm -hmm. your credit cards every month, never, ever let your credit card payment not be the full amount. 
because if you don't, if you, and you, if you can't do that, cut up your credit cards. Yep. If you go one month, if you go one month where you have spent more on your credit cards, then you can pay back. That is a sign that you need to cut up your credit card and start just using debit cards because that means you can't handle it because you, you spent more because when you're spending that money on a, on a credit card, let's say it's $2,000 in a month that you, and you know, you have $2,000 coming in an in income that you can use. Well, if you spent more than $2,000 knowing that, then you to put bluntly are not responsible enough to own a credit card. Yep. So you need to cut it up. And so you have to do that and also live on one income. And if you are currently in a situation where you're living on two incomes, your wife and yours, do everything you can, cut expenses, move if you have to, whatever the case may be, so that you're only living on, on dad's income. So that only that one income is the only one that you need for your expenses. And that way, the if your wife is still working, let's say you don't have kids or whatever the situation is, even if your kids are out of the house, whatever the case may be, use that extra income, the wife's income, for things like savings, uh, saving up maybe for a, a down payment on a house, whatever whatever the needs are, things we'll talk about a little bit more. But I think mm -hmm. so. Stay out of debt, uh, and also the things Kennedy said, I would agree with too. Uh, you got to have an emergency fund. Uh, ideally, you have three to six months of living yeah. expenses <clears throat> saved up, and because that way, if there's if something happens, like all of a sudden a virus hits the entire <laughs> world and everybody goes crazy, and you are, are laid off for months, and you had to expect it's never going to happen. Oh yeah, I know, crazy idea there. Yeah. But if that happens, and you have three to six months. You're not waiting for the government to bail you out. Instead, you're able to, to, to handle it hmm. and you're able to, to, to weather that storm. And so if you're in a situation today where you're not able to do that, that's your goal. Yep. Your goal is to, and I would say there's an ordering here that I think matters too, in that I would say, if, let's say you're in a situation where you're in debt right now and you have no emergency fund. So the question is, which one do you do first? I would say you make those payments on your debt that you, the, re, the minimum required in the sense that you're paying, you're not adding to it. Yep. You build up that emergency fund first, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You have that. And once you have that, then you start pouring everything you can into your uh, paying off your debts. Right. And by debts, I pr primarily mean your non-mortgage debts. I mean your yep. credit card, your student loan, your car loan, things like that. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think you should get a car on loan. Yeah. If that means you get a thousand dollar beater, that's what you get. Yeah. Uh, if you can help it, and so I think all those things add up to a, a process. I mean, I am almost fifty years old, so I've been doing this for I've been, my twenty uh, fifth wedding anniversary is coming up here next month. Awesome. So I've been doing this for a while, and so I'm in a situation now where I have the ability when something like the coronavirus hits, something like that, that I have some savings so I can weather a storm like this, even with seven kids. But let me tell you, when I was 25, I had nothing. In fact, just a, another quick story. I was at uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville, this is before I was married, getting my master's degree. And I was using student debt to do it. And I don't recommend this now, but I was doing it at the time. And I had been there for a year and a half and I realized that if I continued and I finished my degree, that would most likely be the fact that my student loan amount would be greater than my annual income would probably be just for my student loan. And I remember and that started to bother me. And then a friend of mine who was in the program as well, he had kids and he actually mentioned how he was on food stamps. He was going to student bill, getting a master's degree, getting all this student, student debt and he was supporting his family through uh, government food stamps. And I'll tell you what, scared the crap out of me. And I, and I, I literally I remember walking into uh, my, my wife, who was not my wife yet, she's my fiance. She came over for dinner. I remember sitting down saying, honey, I'm quitting school. I said, I can't, this is not responsible. We're about to get married in a month and I'm gonna just bury us in debt to get started in our marriage. That is not something a Catholic husband and father should do. I said, I'm just quitting. And it was 17 years later, I finally finished my degree through online, through the, the distance ed program at Franciscan. I'd started it there and I finished it 17 years later because I just told myself, I have to quit and get a job. And so even if it's something you want to do, you may feel God's calling you to do it. If it's, if it's leading you into a bad financial situation, God is not calling you into it. Right. And that was my sign because I really felt called that God wanted me to get this master's degree in theology so I could teach people about the faith and, and 
blah, blah, blah. But the very fact that I couldn't do it without going into significant student debt is God telling me, no, that's not what I want you to do right now. And There's so I that, think that's a good, let's go. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's really great, Eric, because a lot, um, it, it, so much of this goes back to our basic duties of our state in life. And that's, that's God's general will for everybody who's in these different, in like the very marriage vocation. And so I, I did the, I did a similar thing. At least I, I was working in the nonprofit sector, which doesn't make a lot of money. And then I was getting married. And so I quit that and I got into a, got into cor got into the corporate world working at an office, um, which was not what I prefer to do, you know, for my own, you know, what I, what, you know, my calling or whatever, but, uh, it was necessary and it, you know, that's what I needed to do to make the money for the family. So, um, mm. I loved what you said, Eric, it sounds like you did everything right financially. I mean, I'm sure you've, you know, made mistakes or whatever, but you have this great ideal sort of, uh, story where you started off, uh, and that was what, uh, I heard from Ripperger once. And that when you first get married, you should work, you, you should live on the one income of the father and not count on the income of the mother or the, you know, the wife, husband and wife rather. Um, so that you can have, you can have this standard living because another part of this is not just mathematics, but it's also a mindset, which is very, a very powerful thing. Everybody has a mindset as to what they consider to be a good standard of living. And money is such a psychological thing as well, because because we're just thinking about how much money we have is is what we have enough or is it not enough and so it, it, judging that as much as possible i think starting off is is i you know i never did that um when i got married and i wish i would have wish you know wish i would have had this wisdom at that time um but starting off like that is is so great because you can establish a, a certain amount of standard of living because you're you're uh, establishing a home with that single income um <clears throat> But I, I, yeah, I wanted to, I mean, I just don't see any way to have credit. You know, if you're just, you're 18, you're single, um, it seems like the best thing you can do long term for yourself is get a credit card and pay it off every month, you know, and get credit because you have to have the credit long term to get a house and everything. So I don't see a way around that, um, unfortunately. I, I mean, can it's, it's, a, it's a reality. I know my own kids who are, who, when they leave the house, that's the advice I give them. I say, ideally, you should not ever need a credit card. I said, but the reality of the world is in order to get a mortgage, which is the one debt that is Acceptable. unavoidable. And it's also financially responsible in a lot of ways because owning a house where you're paying off the mortgage is in most cases a better financial decision than renting for your entire life. Yeah. And so it's actually a good thing to do if it's done responsibly, but you can't get that mortgage without the credit card. But again, if you have to, if you find that you can't pay off that credit card each month, you have to cut it up and just say, well, I guess I'm going to be renting for a long time. And that's just the reality and recognize your own strengths and weaknesses. For me, it was always not a big deal. My dad, he is, he, two people really set me straight early on in finances. My dad, who very much was very good at his finances. And he just, it was like by osmosis, he taught me the importance of all these things. And also a guy, everybody knows Dave Ramsey, but there's a guy old enough. His name is Larry Burkett. He's an old Protestant. He's, he's passed away now. Uh, a Protestant uh, teacher who taught finances back in the early nineties. And he was very much into the live off of one income. Don't go into debt and stuff like that. And I read all his stuff. I think my, my pastor at my my youth pastor at my uh, Protestant church I was in at the t in college, he's the one who recommended him to me. And that really set me straight on the right path. But yeah, I would say, though, things like car anything other than a credit card that you pay off every month, mm -hmm. and then, of course, a mortgage, I don't think you should really do anything else. You should not do a um, car loan, definitely, if you can help it. A student loan, I think, is a debatable topic because... There are some professions in which a college education is necessary and which you need, to, you will probably go into debt on a certain level. But I think it's really a lot of it has to do with the situation and what you're going to. If you are going into $100,000 debt to get an art history degree, you're not too bright. You work at Starbucks after. <laughs> but if you're going, if you get a $15,000 student loan, to get a law degree, for example, or yep. a or something like that, 
there's a lot more financial sense to that. Yeah. And so like my kids, when they, when I, my, my advice to them when they go off to college is, is that you need to have a plan for college. It's not just an extension of high school. Yeah. And your plan is, okay, I'm going to go into this field. Mm -hmm. And therefore, because I'm going to this field, a reasonable student loan will be X, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really, so student loan, I think is, I think it's 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 a little bit more of a uh, prudential decision. I do think though we're getting in in a time where a college degree is actually less important. Yep. I was in the computer field for a long time, and for a, a number of those years, I was hiring people. And I'll be honest, a four year computer degree didn't necessarily impress me as much as just some guy who had created apps on for phones and websites on his own. I mean, my best programmer. I ever had who worked for me had an English degree. Yeah, he just good with computers. He just was good. So, yeah. so there's, and there's other fields, there's fields like that. So if you can code, for example, there's lots of ways to learn how to code without getting a four year degree. And so without going to debt. So I just think you need to be thinking of college, not as, okay, it's just an extension of high school, but okay, I have a plan for college. And if you don't have a plan for college graduating, you need to just go get a job and then think about it. And, and then if you do end up with a plan, like I know people who go back to college in their 30s and 40s, and it's a perfect opportunity for them then because now they know exactly what they want to do with it. Right. Whereas yeah. you have an I wanna, who has no idea. Yeah. Who goes. And I, I just, yeah, I just want to point this out about college. Yes, because in my my office job that I work in the day as well, they they initially required a four-year degree and now they just dropped that requirement recently. So now I, you know, I got that basically for nothing or whatever, but um <laughs> Yeah, and and because nobody went into all these trades, like being an electrician or whatever, um, now those are in high demand. So you can actually come out of the gate at 18, become an apprentice and a journeyman in two or three years at the time that it took me to go into debt for four years. Right. And you can come out and start working at uh, 1.5 to twice the salary that I started out with with a Ford degree. So it, it makes very little financial sense to pursue college, at least as a default, as to say, well, everybody should go to college. You know, we really needed to question that whole thing. It's, it's bit become an issue, but I want to get into budgeting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and because, uh, try to get into some budgeting techniques, um, and then go into some more, uh, specifics. We've, we've kind of agreed that we ideally we want to only have the mortgage as the only debt. That's the ideal situation. Um, and how do you get to that point? Let's say, you know, you're 16 years old, you're a single man watching this video. We've already said you need to get a credit card so you can have credit eventually long term. And what I something that really helped me is a software that I'm going to recommend. I'm not getting any royalties from this recommendation, but it's called YNAB, which stands for you need a budget. <laughs> and it's an envelope system. I think Dave Ramsey has the same idea. Yeah. But the, the idea is you are setting aside all of your income for all of your expenses a month prior to actually paying them. Right. So every month you're setting aside, I set, I'm setting aside X for the mortgage, X for the water bill, everything setting aside, but I'm not, those are all the payments for the next month. Yep. And that really helped me because I was actually using uh, the credit card to try to get these percentage rewards or whatever, but I switched over to this YNAB system, which is where just you just set everything aside. And what's great about this is it's actually using not a month to month budget, but a year to year budget, because what, what it does is it actually plans for, so you have an envelope for gifts, for example, you know, so right. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy my mother a gift for Mother's Day, my wife for Mother's Day, you know, I've got birthdays and all this stuff and Christmas. But it's not every single month that I have that expense. So this system, it, to me, is so uh, has been helpful for me so much because I have a spreadsheet where I can plan my entire year. So then I I can calculate. Okay, I'm going to spend about thirty dollars for this kid. I'm going to spend thirty dollars for this cousin, and add it all up. And then I'll just put every month that amount into that envelope so that I have that available. And that is really great because then you're ready for the, those irregular expenses that don't happen every month. So that system has, has been very helpful to me. Um, what, uh, let's see, Eric, what uh, budgeting system do you use? Well, we, uh, my boy Larry Burkett back in the day, he was a big proponent of the, of the envelope system. So we literally used envelopes 
for the first about 10 years of our marriage. Can you where, break, down, break that down, Eric? What What is, if nobody's ever heard of that, what is Yeah, that? so what we did was we had an envelope for each category of expense. And so, for example, we had an envelope for uh, medical expenses, for uh, car expenses, for food, for rent, for uh, entertainment, all those different categories. And we would budget out and we'd say, okay, food, $500 is the budget. And so we would, I would literally on payday this, I don't do this anymore because internet and everything's electronic now, but at the time I would literally get cash out. And so I take $500 in cash and I put it in the food envelope. Then my wife, when it was time to go grocery shopping, she would get the food envelope. She'd take out the money and she'd go buy whatever it was. And so, and we, so we would do that. And we, like you said, we do it at the beginning of the month for that month. And so we knew we had to live within that, those means. Now, let's say one month, for example, gifts is a good example. We would, let's say it was $50 a month for gifts. Well, one month we might only use $20. What do we do with that 30? It carries over to the next month. And so now we have $80 in the envelope the next month, because what's happening is that's building for November <laughs> when all of a sudden Christmas is coming. And now we might have $200 sitting in that envelope that's been building up over the year. And so now we can get gifts for the kids because we have $200 built up for it because we know our expenses, they're not the exact same every month. So we get the average of them. Now, since then we've moved into, it's all done. We do it electronically. I literally just use an Excel spreadsheet. Now it's Google Sheets. We just use a spreadsheet and I have different categories. I have the food category. I have the medical expenses category. I have the auto uh, expenses. And we do, but I do the same thing. And so what I do is uh, when I, I mean, my pay is a little bit different now because I work for myself. So it's not like I get a paycheck on a certain time, but I kind of make it so I do. Right. So I personally, because of just being an independent contractor stuff, I just get money that comes in randomly. But what I do is I say, okay, on, a, uh, on the first of the month, I pay myself by putting the money into these different categories. Hmm. And then and then when the, the expenses are taken, so for example, my wife goes grocery shopping and now let me tell you, $500 a month ain't gonna do it. Um, <laughs> not with my family. And so that's like my son alone. Um, and, so then, <laughs> and so then what we do is we just, we, we go through and we spend, and so when she spends that, I take it out of the spreadsheet of that category. And about once, what I do is now I once a month, I put the money in. And then once a month, I say, okay, have we done okay? And and because it's we have a little bit of buffer now, like I said, I'm older, we have a little bit of extra. If we go over, then what we do is we have a conversation. Because back when we were first married, we couldn't go over. If she had blown the $500 on food at the beginning of the month, we're eating ramen noodles at the end of the month. Because <laughs> we just don't have any more money. And ramen noodles are the greatest thing ever, by the way. I can't eat them anymore, but man, sure. I mean, 30 cents or whatever it is for a full meal, basically. But I mean, that's what we did. Now we don't necessarily do it. But what we do is I will look at now in the spreadsheet and say, wait a second, we were over on this expense the last two months. And I'll sit down with my wife and say, why was that? We might decide it's because legitimately, let's say my son is eating more. It might be some legitimate reasons, or it might be, you know, we were getting a little bit lazy, a little bit spending a little bit more than we should have. And we have a discussion about that. And we try to figure out how to make that work. But the other thing I want to mention about this system is the number one envelope that we start with is the tithe envelope. Yeah. And so we put 10%, no matter what, we take 10% of, of our income and we put it in that envelope. Now, like I said, it's a, it's a spreadsheet cell, but in the day it would be, a, 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 literally it would be an envelope. And then, and that would always be 10% no matter what. And that's a, that was a big thing. It's always been a big thing for me is that you do that first. And you figure out how to live on everything else. You don't go the other way around. You pay the ten percent to God. You give it back to Him, and then you uh, and then you just and then you figure out. Okay, now I can. I you have to live off of ninety percent of your income is the point. And I, I'm a big believer that that is a vital part of budgeting. Is that ten percent is the first thing, not the last thing, but the first thing you do with your with your budget. And if you're in a situation where Oh, one of your envelopes should be savings as well. And so that is savings, but the 10% has to come before savings even. And before any, I, I, before anything, the 10% for, for the tithe and how you, what you do with that tithe is each individual uh, has to decide how much goes to their parish, how much goes to different charities and things like that. But 
I, I just think your 10% envelope for, for tithe has to be the first one. And then you live off the 90%. Cool. Thanks, Eric. Kennedy, you have any thoughts on that budgeting system? Uh, no, that that's makes sense. Um, I use a, we use an app called every dollar. It's the Dave Ramsey one. To be honest, we were just a couple of years ago. Somebody just told us to do Dave Ramsey. So we just use the app and it's actually pretty good. Um, a lot of these apps that are American, they don't have the functionality where we can use them with our online banking, uh, in Canada. Like it doesn't, it doesn't mat, it doesn't, it doesn't seamlessly go through it. Um, we, there is a couple here in Canada that do the budgeting direct to your, um, online banking, but the every dollar one, we actually liked the functionality better. And it was, it was worth the like one extra button we had to press to use our online banking one. It wasn't really a problem. And I would say though, just as a practical tip, <clears throat> when you have to get when you have to do a credit card to get some sort of credit for one, there are still certain private mortgage underwriters that, um, if you, sh they'll actually sit down with you and interview you and, uh, they'll actually take into account like you, who you are as a person and, They'll take, I mean, they won't take a real risk on you, but it's like, okay, you have this much in your bank account. You're show me, showing me you pay your bills very well. They'll underwrite you a mortgage, perhaps with a different credit rating than, than a traditional bank would. So that's something to look into for certain people, especially if you have a good down payment. Um, but there are certain ways you can do the whole pay your credit card back thing every month in a way that's not dangerous at all. So for example, everybody has a cell phone bill. Okay. And the cell phone people will always give you the option. Yeah, some places might say, I don't know, you have to have a credit card. A lot of them they'll say, do you want to sign up for direct withdrawal from your credit card? Do you want to do bank account, whatever? Well, let's just say you got a $60 cell phone bill. Just put that on your credit card and just schedule in your checking account from your from your bank that it just goes right to your credit card, $60 every month. It's really, you're just paying it with your debit card, but it's scheduled out of your credit card. Don't even carry the credit card with you if you don't want to. It's just the the transaction is happening through it. So therefore you technically are paying your credit card off. Um, and then I would, uh, and, and then as far as the envelope goes, it works very well. I one time was in a, uh, an assembly at a youth event. That's as far as I'll go with it. And there was someone that was brought in to talk about budgeting. And he, he was like, a, he was actually a comedian. So his financial advice turned out to be kind of a joke, but, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. but he, uh, he actually was giving advice and he said, here's the reason why budgets never work. And then he just went on to say basically how budgets don't work. It's all about habits, these kinds of things. And it was just very soft and it didn't, I mean, the kids were entertained, but no one learned anything about money, but just as an inspirational story, my no, no, God rest his soul. He moved a, my mom moved over from Italy, uh, 1967 with her family. And um, they came over with like zero dollars, lived in a basement for the first year. He got a job at Crane, which is like American standard, um, like toilets and that kind of thing. There was a big factory here in Stratford that moved to Mexico recently, as, as they do. Um, but he moved over. He was like 41 years old, got this job, worked there for 25 years. When we first got here, um, you could get a mortgage. Uh, we had, I think you had to have about a 25% down payment at that time. This is like late 1960s. So he was able to save that within one year with my no-no working as well, living out of the basement of his brother's house. And every weekend, every weekend, he would go down to Chicago. His uncle, who was like his dad because his father had passed away when he was very young, his uncle owned a, um, like a bodega in Chicago. And he had moved over to America in the 1940s, I think. And um, so he would go down there, take the train from Stratford through Port Huron, down, it was like the Amtrak or whatever, and you could come from Canada easily back then. Every weekend he would go down and he'd paint houses on the weekend. And my nono had grown up under Mussolini, so he had uh, a healthy distrust of government officials. So he would come back over the border with the money like taped around <laughs> underneath his shirt. <laughs> the guy was my hero. So anyway, he would do that. And what he would do is he would seek to live off of the extra money he would make in cash. And they did that as best as possible. And then every month, my nona was a very trusting man. He was a very faithful man. And he would uh, he would go into the bank and he would bring the lady, you know, X amount of cash. Oops, the microphone. Bring the lady some cash to pay off the mortgage. Four or five years in, or four to, four to eight years, whenever it was, he brings money in. And she goes, Joe, his name was Giuseppe. She goes, Joe, you don't owe us any more money. He said, what? And he had finished paying off his mortgage. Uh... He was a very 
stereotypical Italian man. So he grabbed her, he kissed her on the cheek. He actually was a beautiful singer. He started singing this operatic <laughs> tune, like from uh, he was in those. He was in Italian choirs and stuff growing up, and he was crying. And but the point is, is his habits. His virtue, the way that he dealt with his money was so good that he paid off of his mortgage without even knowing how much was left. Wow. Anyway, this is a pretty cool story. When uh, I uh, when we paid off our student loans right before our first baby was born, yeah. I literally called the number to listen to them to say my balance was zero dollars and zero cents like four or five times. And I like my wife and I would listen to it and hear it say, Your balance is zero dollars and zero cents. And we're like, Woohoo! <laughs> so we were wow. very excited about that. That's cool. Yeah, that, that goes into just the, the importance as a man of the side hustle, which is you've got your main job and you've got side jobs or side just income areas or avenues or whatever to get extra income on the side here and there. Um, and the so that you can get enough income for because even if you start off with a single income, you do everything right. It, it is difficult to live on a single income yeah. often, you know, if you have a ton of kids. Um, so, but it is our duty as men to provide that so that our wife can be home with the kids. And so that is, that's our job. Work two jobs, work three jobs, whatever is necessary, whatever you need to do to get the job done for your wife and your kids. So um, we talked, I want to just, touch it maybe five ten more minutes on some try to get some more specifics and then i want to take some questions um so please save your questions uh everybody who's watching we got 80 people right now on the live um just save your questions in case i miss them and we'll get to those in about, ten, in about 10 minutes um but we've basically got a, a timeline ideally the ideal timeline where uh you you do get a credit card you've got credit you build up some credit you uh find a wife you get married, you live off your single income and you buy a house. Eventually you've got credit. Um, now we talked about car loans as much as possible to pay those in cash to, to avoid that debt as well. Uh, we talked about college if necessary, thinking about it as a long-term thing in terms of the, um, the, the full risk involved, the, the full plan in terms of is, is this college loan uh, sort of proportionate to my estimated income for this profession long term. Uh, talked about the trades, just avoiding college. Um, we did not really touch on, let's see, health insurance or savings and investments. Um, I think, at least in America, it's pretty standard. I mean, I've got a 401k with my office job, um, and saving for retirement is is also extremely necessary. I think what, when I asked my father-in-law on about uh, what would he do 20 years ago, he said he would make a, an extra mortgage payment every year mm. and he would try to live off of 75% of in, his income and just putting that savings back into the long term for retirement was so important to him looking back. Um, but I also have a, I have a Roth IRA for just expenses for my kids. Um, I know Ripperger said, has said that you are not actually responsible for funding your children's college. Yep. He yep. says that you are responsible for getting them to 18 yep. and that's it. And everything above that is kind of surplus. So um, I think, I mean, I, I've talked with my wife about, I just want my, I want my children to be able to be ready to be, to be married at 18, if they so choose, uh, at least to have the maturity and the know-how to navigate the finances and have the maturity and in, in emotionally and spiritually to be able to be a spouse at 18. Um, so that, I mean, that's my goal as a father. Um, but, uh, that's that's a key point because we we do think that we do have to fund all that and it is quite expensive. Uh, Eric, do you want to speak to that? Having some children, I don't have any children, nor, nor does Kennedy in college. I actually remember when I was, I guess my oldest kid was probably about seven or eight, and I was and I had four kids at this point, and I was stressing. They were two years apart, and I was stressing out about helping pay for the college. Mm -hmm. And actually, I was going to a spiritual director at the time. 
And I remember telling him, this is really stressing me out. And he just, he just kind of smacked me upside the head with words. And he just said, Eric, he's like, that's not your responsibility. It's like, you are just being anxious about something that's not even your duty as a father to do. Sure, if you have a bunch of money and you can help them and, and that works out, that's great. Said, but you have zero responsibility to help pay for their college. And it really was a, a weight off of my shoulders because I realized, no, my goal is to get them to 18. Mm -hmm. And I'm a father. I kind of feel like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a father to them their whole lives, of course. But I'm an I'm a active, active father until they're 18 and a passive father, so to speak, after 18. I'm more, more advice giving at that point. Right. Um, and, and so I really do think that's important for people to remember that you are not responsible for your kids college education to pay for it. You are responsible to get them to adulthood, which is 18. And that's it. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's important uh, in, when it comes to college loans for your own kids is don't. And I have three and we've been blessed that we've been able to help them some, but not not completely or anything like that. We're able to give them a little bit to help them out. Um, but that's, you know, which is great, but I've told them very clearly. And I actually told them before they are, when they're thinking about college and high school, I say, listen, mom and I really will save up a little bit. We have some, we can help you out with college. But if you decide not to go to college and you have a plan, mm -hmm. we'll give you that money anyway. Yeah. We're going to give you know, that money we saved up for you for college. We'll give you that money as a little startup. Uh, so you can go off and, and now if, they're, if they just say, I'm just going to live in your basement and be a deadbeat, I'm not going to give them any money. But if they, and I'm not going <laughs> to let them do that either. But if they yeah, say, yeah. listen, Dad, here's my plan. I'm not going to college, but I, I'm going to work in this industry, and here's what I, my plans are. I'm going to give them the, the money I was going to give them for uh, college and say, okay, here's something to get you going and get you started. So, And I would say that um, – what? so we have four children who are all four years old and under. Well, and um, so God willing, we'll be up near seven or eight or ten or whatever kids. My wife's 31, so we've got a little few years left of that. Um and the first thing everybody always says to us, because we're kind of, you know, we're like the practicing Catholics in our families. So no one really is. So no one understands this whole open to life thing, right? And uh, they're like, well, how are you going to pay for school? That's kind of the first thing. How are you going to afford having kids? And I'm like, well, children, I mean, they don't actually, they're, they're free, actually. Like, you don't have, like, you make them and you bring them home. So they don't actually, you don't have to, like, buy them from the hospital, I guess. Um, and then they don't eat much when they're little. I mean, mom feeds them and the food is cheap. They're not as expensive as people think that you hear these numbers like nowhere every near child, as expensive. No, every yeah. child is going to cost you, you know, $2 million or whatever. It's like, okay, because <laughs> they, cause, and it, 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 seriously, you'll see this in the average cost, or, you know, whatever the Time Magazine cost or whatever mainstream publication, but they're factoring in like, well, every children's going to have to have their own violin and everyone's going to have to play. <laughs> they're all going to have to play AAA hockey. Uh, from the age of seven years old with uh, new equipment every year. So sports are going to cost you $870,000 by the time they're 12 years old. You know, and I'm just like, well, the goodwill exists. So do you guys have the goodwill in the States? Like a thrift yep. shop? Yeah, yep. so the goodwill. Yep. And I mean, like, anyway. So, but one of the things people say is education. And I'm like, I'm not going, I mean, once again, if I can, great. But I was doing some mental math one day. I had a friend who I grew up with who was Dutch. And he was good with money. I know that's never happened before. And, um, he just, you know, worked golf courses and stuff. His family like did an Excel spreadsheet from a young age. Like the kids just knew how to save money. He graduated high school with like forty or fifty thousand dollars in his bank account just from and we still had fun. He would buy pizza and you know, like he was a normal kid, so to speak, but he just saved his money, did well. He had good habits, saved his birthday money. His parents would be like, Okay, you know, you made four hundred dollars in this paycheck. Please give us three hundred and fifty. We're gonna put it in your account for you, and you have fifty dollars for social money. Little things like that. So by the time he was out of there, I mean, paying for school was a breeze for him. Not even even if he had lost his money, like let's say I know, something bad happened, he would have had the habits to take out a very small loan and pay that back by the end of the next summer. That's so. So the best thing that you can give your kids is the habits to pay off the things they have to pay for, um, and everything else is gravy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we're yeah. we're just. Oh, Eric, Eric, go ahead. I was going to say, in a general, <clears throat> adding on to that, a general sense of what is a value you have to teach your yep. kids. A value isn't the $5,000 trip to the Bahamas or whatever, the, yep. the family vacation where you all fly out to California. That is not what's a value. And if you live simply and your entire, your, your kids will learn that by osmosis. Yep. And so, yep. 
they won't think we have to spend money in order to mm -hmm. find value, right. in order to find happiness or anything like that. I mean, the, the thing I'm most proud of with my kids who have left the home is that we, we joke around about this, but they're just really cheap. <laughs> and, uh, and they get that. The funny thing is my dad taught me to be super cheap, but then I actually married somebody cheaper than me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> And so like, I always thought I was like the cheapest guy on earth. And all of a sudden my wife is even more so. She's like, why'd you buy a brand name ramen noodles? You know, there's no, right. Name. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, really, it would be of that level. And, uh, you know, she, you know, I would buy, I, I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable. And so, but that just then became just the way we lived. Awesome. And so then our kids picked that up. And so, and I know some of this is personality. I understand some personalities, it's, it's more of a struggle, but that's the whole point of virtues and vices is that some vices were more attracted to than others and some virtues more attracted to than the others. But so the point is, is like my kids though learned not to think that in order to have fun or do something enjoyable, you had to spend money. Just going to the, the state park for them, you know, we would take a vacation. We've never taken a vacation as a family where we had to fly. Right. Uh, we always drive. We usually, we, if we, most of our vacations would be staying with family, but if we didn't, we'd stay at like a state park cabin. So right. you say a state park cabin, it's like 30 bucks a night or something. You get a whole cabin. And it's yeah. great. It's actually more fun than a hotel or something like that. Now, of course, with Airbnb, it's so much more inexpensive to, to travel with a, with a large family than it used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, my kids, I remember one time, I can't remember what it was for, but we stayed in a hotel for something. And my kids thought was the, I mean, it was like going into magic land because <laughs> they had never been in a hotel before. And the whole concept of a hotel, and we actually had two rooms with a, and they were so interested by the door between them and they'd run up and down the halls and stuff. And, and they just thought it was the greatest thing on earth was just staying in a hotel. But that's, that's a good thing that that wasn't a normal thing for them. And so then they built these habits that they realized, okay, I don't have to take these expensive trips. I don't have to buy get our cars have always been used cars and things like that. I think mm -hmm. that's the thing as a father, they're going to learn more just by the way you do. I don't think my dad ever sat down with me and taught me about money. He just simply demonstrated it by how he lived. And then when I had questions, he answered them and that was enough for me to learn it. And maybe I might, maybe he should be more explicit. Some parents might, but if you live it, the kids will then live it. And I think that's the first step of not going into debt not being having a good budget is that you just simply you, you keep your expenses down. Mm -hmm. and one last thing just made me think of something that I'll just quickly. A buddy of mine worked at a car dealership for years, and he showed he showed he he did some math with me with me once because we were thinking, okay, do we have to get a bigger van or what should we do? And he said, when you're trying to buy a car, everyone will say, well, if you get a used car, you have to fix it all the time. He said, fine. He says, don't think about the individual, up, um, like how much it'll cost each time you have to fix it. Divide what you think you're going to spend by 52 weeks. And we sat down and it was like, oh, yeah, even if I had to fix this car three times this year for $3,000 each time, it was still half the price per week of getting the car on the loan overall. And it was just a very helpful tip. Something to think about. Yeah, the car loans are, it's quite remarkable when you do do the math and you find yeah. out how much you actually do spend on a on the whole term of a car loan. So, uh, yeah, definitely. There's, there's a lot of people talking in the chat about okay. dating. Uh, and I one thing I just wanted to say for single men in Worship. particular, um, yeah, go, go and watch Kennedy and Mai's video, um, What They Didn't Tell You About NFP and Chastity. Dating's a bad that. word. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one important thing is that a woman wants in her man, she wants security. She wants safety. She wants to feel protected and provided for. And part of that is giving a woman the security that you have the finances figured out so that you have, you're, you've already figured this out as a single man. You've already got your finances all set in order. And you've got it all figured out. And then when you do, you you know, you are seeking a wife, you're courting someone or whatever, that's something that's attractive to a woman because she wants to feel safe so that she can trust you and just allow uh, you to handle these things so that she doesn't have to worry about it. That's what kind of what we talked about in the very beginning of the show is just that peace and security that our job is to provide that for our wives. And, and so, so much of that is, is that peace and security. So as a single man, one of the best things you can do besides other obvious things like comb your hair and stay in a state of grace 
is power. to get your own finances taken care of, you know? So, uh, so that's one aspect. I want to get to uh, Una Fides, who asks this. Can you guys speak as to where to tithe? What your recommendations are to everyone as to local parish or other more solid sources? Uh, Eric, do you want to? Well, I think some of it is dependent upon the person. And my wife and I, our passions are pro-life work and helping the poor. Those are just the two charities that areas that we really feel strongly about. And so what we do is we give to the, lo the local uh, pro-life pregnancy center regularly. And then we also give to a local uh, soup kitchen that I volunteer at that, that does good work. And that's beyond what we get. And we give to our parish. And right. I, I don't really want to get into the whole diocesan money and all that stuff. I, I personally believe that if you don't feel comfortable giving to your parish, you probably should go to a different parish. Yeah. Uh, and so like you, your parish, you should, you should support my, my own personal thing is 10% tithe, 5% of that goes to the parish. And then the other 5%, my wife and I basically come together and we decide uh, often we'll also give to religious orders. Uh, you know, in the past we've given to the F FSSP when we went to an FSSP parish, uh, we go now to an oratory and parish. So we mm -hmm. give to the oratory. Uh, so, you know, it just depends on your own situation, but I think you decide what, is, what are you passionate about? Are you passionate about, for example, uh, promoting the Latin mass? Well, then the FSSP <laughs> is a good uh, religious order to give to. I, I'm a big, I really like particularly giving to religious orders because typically they are ones I've researched, of course, but they're not living high off the hog. Yeah. They're usually living very close to the edge. And so they're not wasting your money. And I think it's a good thing. I would definitely recommend against giving to large, large organizations Fields. and charities, yeah. uh, you know, USCCB stuff, uh, those large, because so much of that is used for administrative work. And right. it's just not really, I, I like giving close to the ground. Like I like, like I mentioned, I give to a local pregnancy center, a local soup kitchen, our local oratorians, our, there's a, a, or our sisters that we locally we donate to. I really think that's, that should be your first, because that's your first responsibility is your local community. You give to them first. And then maybe you look at more national <laughs> things after that. But I, I really think the local, supporting your local parish and your local community charities that you feel passionate about are important. Yeah, and, and uh, a couple of people were asking about tithing off of your gross income or your net income. I, I've always considered it gross income. What do you, is that what you, you guys do? First of uh, all, shout out to Mike. I know him. Oh, what's up, Mike? Our, He's a friend of mine. Well, it's interesting. Actually, so our uh, priest, he in one, uh, I could actually maybe I could maybe I could find the bulletin and we put in the show notes. Um, he actually did the math. So he did, he, like, we're here in Ontario. And so he, Ontario, Canada, not Ontario, California. And he, uh, he did the math about like what we pay in taxes and all that kind of stuff. And he actually broke it down for us how much he would expect of us to give to the parish each week. It was actually pretty helpful. Um, it gave us a sort of number value. He, it worked out to be about like a full hour to two hours of your salary pay per week. So we said, if you have a minimum wage job, it's like, 10 to $15 a week, which doesn't seem like much, but with all the taxes and things being taken up, so we have, I mean, it's Canada, we, we're even more communist than others. So the taxes could be kind of high. Um, so he was going off of net actually, um, because he was basically saying a lot of your money was getting taken away anyway. And that was his advice. Um, but I have heard people say it's off of your gross pay. Um, we sat, we've sat down with our priests and with others at our, at our chapel and stuff. And, um, and they've had different opinions. So I don't know what you guys think. I, I do off take home pay. Um, I don't do I don't include taxes in it because it's being taken away from me. Now, if for some right. reason, like when I used to have a job where the, my taxes were taken away from me automatically, now I have to pay my own taxes because of self employment. But when it's taken out, if let's say too much was taken out and then I got a refund, which is really my money <laughs> came back to me in April, right. uh, when I did taxes. Then I would say, okay, that some of that needs to go because obviously that was money that is mine. So I would tithe off of that as well. Right. One thing I did for a while, it's just kind of a crazy idea, and, and I, I kind of liked it, was when I was in a situation, not really in it now, but I, at one point I had a job that was paying very well. And so I was tithing 10% of my take home, but then I was I had a lot for savings. We were still living frugally. And so I would say it was like 20% of my take home pay was going to savings, some large amount. I can't remember exactly. You know what I would do? I would put the 10% out, and then I would take a 
uh, I would I would take a random number generator from one to a hundred on a computer. Yes, I'm a nerd, <laughs> and I would roll that, and whatever it came up to, that was the percent of the savings I would then give out to charity. So okay. if it came up to fifty percent, then I would give fifty percent of my savings of that for that month actually to charity. But I figured God would determine how much whatever casting it was. lots. It was casting it was casting lots. lots. Yeah. If it came out to hundred, that means the whole savings Excellent. for that month went to tithe. If it came to zero then it would be nothing because that's what God wanted. And I, I kind of, it was kind of weird, but I, I like doing it. So, but I do, I definitely do take home pay typically okay, is okay. my tie. Yeah. So Samuel Rhodes says, what about travel to traditional Latin mass? I have to drive one hour to get a good liturgy and that wears on gas and car. Yes. I, I mean, my opinion, there's really no, I, that is the most important thing to me. I, I would gladly spend whatever is necessary. Uh, I guess there is a certain limit to that, though. I'm not going to be, you know, if it was a three hour drive or whatever, I might consider moving at that point. But yeah. um, I, I mean, I think the liturgy is the center of the family life. I, I think that that's a small price to pay. Well, just but like I you, said, tide yeah. is the first thing. This is the first thing. And right. Right. You, you go you, you figure out a way to work it out. And whatever the expense is for traveling to the traditional Latin mass, you factor that into your, okay, maybe you have to, maybe you have to live where you live because of work or family, or whatever. Well, then you might have to, to uh, downgrade your living situation to save some money so that you can pay for the gas and car to get to the TLM. I do think that's a, that's the top priority right there. Yep. Uh, give, give God, give God, he gives back. Right? Yes. You'll, you'll get rewarded in certain ways. Absolutely. Um, Let's see. Let me get. Uh, here's uh, Bunini is with us. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, we have a heretic it, with us. How about that? Is it prudent to spend a little money on TV or movie streaming sites like Crunchyroll? Asking for a friend. <laughs> I don't know what Crunchyroll what is, and is I Crunchyroll? hope I, I don't. I'm actually not going to look that up since it's coming from Bunini. <laughs> TV. I mean, TV is the devil. As a rule, <laughs> at least. Uh, but some TV is okay. Uh, so I mean, we actually just are, are we just signed up for uh, Minnow, which is a streaming site for Christian kids cartoons. Oh, okay. So my my son likes Veggie Tales. So oh, Veggie Tales is boss. Right so there. they have a real, Veggie Tales has an amazing uh, little clip on St. Patrick. Oh, things. watch it every St. Patrick's Day. Or whole and it oh, makes yeah. fun of paganism. It's like, oh, oh yeah. the twiggly oh, twig. Like, twig. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is amazing. It's like the yeah. most Catholic. Anyway, Name it's really cool. It. But yeah. to answer the question, I do think it's it depends on your life situation. When my wife and I were first married, funds were very strict. We did not have a TV. We did not have, I mean, there wasn't, I guess I'm old enough. There was really, we didn't even have internet then. Uh, nobody really did. Uh, but the point is, is that we were very bare bones. And we had no expenses outside of basically we need to live on and pay off our student debt. Now, however, we've been married 25 years. I've been working for 25 years. Uh, you know, we have, we're not, we don't have to be that strict. And so I think if you're in different situations, if it's not an immoral situation, if you yeah. know, if you get like, if you know, for example, if, I would never recommend <laughs> Netflix, but let's say Amazon Prime. Yeah, Netflix. Let's say, let's say if you know that if you have Amazon Prime, you're going to watch movies of an immoral nature don't get it It has nothing to do with money but right. if you also know you're in a situation where that's not going to be a temptation to you i don't think there's anything immoral or imprudent even about it if you've already done everything else you've got your debts paid off you are putting extra money into savings you're putting extra money into your paying off your mortgage all those things are happening and you still have a and you've been giving to the church all these other things and you still have a little money left over yeah of course there's nothing wrong then with getting uh, one of those services because I, I'm a big believer, like when we did the envelope system, we first remember, we had an envelope for entertainment because you have to have some money for that because you're not trying to, our state of life is not a monastery. You're not a monk, yeah. So there's nothing wrong with going out to dinner with your wife. In fact, you should go out to dinner with your wife sometimes. There's nothing wrong with catching oh, yeah. a movie and, and things like that. And you need to have the money to do that. You don't want to feel guilty because you went out to dinner. Uh, but if you don't go out to dinner every night. Maybe you can only afford going out once a month. But whatever the case may be, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to quick kind of get into this a little bit. Uh, what Madeline says, is splurging sinful? In particular, if, if family needs, food, clothing, et cetera, and debts are met, is splurging sinful? If you ask being immortal, I, I, I just want to say that this basically gets into the virtue of utropelia, which is right recreation. And Prumer actually defines 
uh, number 245, he says what he defines what exactly reasonable maintenance is. It says reasonable, decent maintenance of each other, the family, includes food, clothing, reasonable recreation, and the ability to give alms to the poor and such gifts as are proper to their state in life. And so right recreation, utropelia, may include TV or movie in always lawful and good movies, of course. They were made in 1940, FYI. Um, but uh, that type of thing, using some kind of recreation, and especially right, right now we're in Easter tide, Christ has risen. This is the perfect time to buy the extra bottle of wine, to buy the, the ham or whatever. This is exactly the time to splurge because Christ has risen. We should be feasting right now within reason. Don't, don't go to, to excess, but that, yes, we should be splurging or whatever at this time because it's a time of feasting and rejoicing. So um, basically it needs to be right recreation, moderated, not too much, not too little. You know, if you're never, you don't have no recreation ever, then you're going to rails. Yeah. yeah. You're going to, this is the same time it talks about this very thing. So I, I, I didn't want to go too far into that, but um, the uh, Familia Vasquez, um, she, let's see. Um, you guys have advice on investing. And then there's a clarification in general. Is it morally acceptable? Is it like gambling? If it's okay, any advice to someone who knows nothing? Um, yeah, investing is certainly morally permissible, um, and gambling can be permissible as well, um, within, within due limits. Um, yeah. and so it, it's, so it sort of often just goes into moderation, but Eric, do you want to take a stab at investing? Yeah. Investing is responsible. In fact, there's different, there's like a, it's like a pyramid of financial responsibility, you have to, your tithing is right there you know, at, the, at the base of the pyramid. You are paying off your debts is, is right there, not, not going into debt if you can help it. You're building your emergency fund and then you have savings. Well, your savings becomes investing. When you've gone beyond your emergency fund and your savings becomes investing and there's different ways to invest. One thing people don't realize is one type of investment is paying off your mortgage early right. because what you're doing is you're dropping the interest payments and so the total amount of interest, because if you get a hundred thousand dollar mortgage, you're on a typical, I don't even know what the rates are, but let's say the, the, the total interest you could pay could be as much as like 50, $80,000 over the life of that 30 year loan. So if you're paying that off early and you can get that down, so you're only paying $30,000, well, you've just saved $50,000 potentially. Yeah. You've invested in a sense because you didn't have to pay that. But then I'd say even beyond that though, it's responsible also then to invest. Now, what to invest in is definitely has to do with your temperament, how much money you have, your, your state of life. And there's lots of different ways to do it. There's nothing wrong, for example, I think, Tim, you mentioned the uh, a 401k at your business, especially if they're matching. That just makes sense because you're getting some free money, basically. Uh, your IRA, uh, uh, I mean, your Roth IRAs, things like that. Uh, just investing yourself in the stock market, I think, is is can be morally permissible and fine. One thing I will note is the first mutual fund I ever got when I was first uh, married, I would I would look at the report, the the quarterly report, and I noticed all of a sudden one quarter they had invested in Playboy, mm. and I contacted them. I said, I'm you know, I'm an investor. I you know what I have five hundred dollars with them. Something didn't matter, but I wrote to them a letter. Said I'd like you to stop investing in Playboy because otherwise I'm going to pull my money out. And they said, Well, we think it's good and blah blah blah. So I pulled my money out of it and I, and I stopped investing in that because that's, that's not a good thing to do. And so I started just picking my own stocks a little bit on a very small level because I just didn't want that to happen anymore where all of a sudden I was accidentally investing in something terrible. I also think there's other ways you can invest uh, real estate investing. Like there's this thing called house hacking, which I'll just mention here because I think it's a great idea. What you do is you buy a house that has, a, uh, an area to live in for somebody else. So it's maybe a two family house, oh. but you buy it, you live in one part of it and you rent out the other part. And so let's say you mortgage on that as a thousand dollars, but you're able to get $400 rent from right. your tenant. Well, now all of a sudden you're getting that $400 is being put into your mortgage, your mortgage payment of a thousand dollars. Now you're only paying $600. And that four hundred dollars being built up on your principal and paying off the interest, things like that, mm -hmm. and that's just like a little trick you can do. And it won't work for everybody. That's not like every situation, but it's it's just my point. There is sometimes try to think outside the box. Things like that, 
that can help you be more responsive with money and build up your portfolio. And you know, this isn't an investment advice show, but at the same time, I do think you should invest money once you've got that foundation laid. That's the key is foundation laid of emergency fund, paying off your debt, yeah. uh, you know, things like that before you go into investing. You never invest, for example, if you hadn't paid your tithe, for example. Cool, yeah, and I, I wanna take just one more question. Uh, Matt Baker, a good friend of mine, also a patron of Meaning of Catholic, he talks about, what about debt jubilee? Um, and when I clarified with him, he was talking about the year of jubilee in Leviticus 25. So every 50 years, all the debts were canceled in Israel. And so everybody got went back to, and everybody who had acquired land, they went back to their original holding that had drawn out and everything. So there was, there was sort of this system that never really was followed, but if it had been followed, it was basically people kind of went back to what they had before. Um, I, I mean, Kennedy, I'd like you to comment on this. I, I mean, I, I see in this a great uh, lesson against um, exponential accumulation of wealth in any society, uh, wherein there is just sort of a, a sucking on everyone else. Um, uh, Kennedy, what, what do you what do well, you think of the Jubilee? I mean, it's uh, actually I think Scott Hahn talks about doing that with his kids every 49th day. Uh, he would have they could come basically it was come spill the beans. It wasn't confession. He's not their priest, but it was kind of come spill the beans to your dad. And it's a good day to do that because I'm in a good mood. It's the 49th day and we'll wipe the slate clean, which is cool. So that the, kind of the, the, the moral aspect of it. But I do know sort of an analogous like a way that that principle was sort of outlined in um, Christian civilization was in the Christian eras, like in the Middle Ages. Um they would, it was required in a lot of places to sign like 99 year leases of uh, property. Um, there wasn't really inflation at the time, but the point was, is that it was a, it was a guard put in place um, so that it was hard for the landowner to exploit the poor person uh, because they just had a 99 year lease at a certain price. I mean, basically, I don't know if there was a little exceptions. Um, and then also it gave the, um, the, the peasant the feeling of ownership even though they wouldn't have been able to own the land because it was practically speaking they were in charge of it because it would have been two three four generations depending on life expectancy of their family um so i guess i mean there's a reason why god put it in the bible uh it's important to have that um also one thing that i've thought about this whole time we've done this show is i keep going to back this term i think of is called the moral hazard Basically, every time we spend money, there's a moral hazard. Every time we think about investing it, there's a moral hazard. Even if we're in a position to lend money, there's a moral hazard. How much we take and we have to pay back, there's a moral hazard. Money at the end of the day, like I said at the beginning, is a magnifying glass on your on how you're going to use your virtue. Um, so I think that these guards set up in the Old Testament were just a way of saying, we're going to put the brakes on at a certain point. So there's no point in getting too crazy. Um, and... And at the same time, we're not going to let you get too crazy into debt the other way because it just wouldn't matter. There's no gain to it. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Let's wrap up. Eric, do you want to tell us a little bit about the book you're writing? <laughs> yeah. Quit here. yeah, sure. It's not related to any of this. But basically, I'm, I'm writing something a book that is called Deadly Indifference. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the religious relativism and indifferentism that has swept over the church over the past 50, 60 years, something like that, I argue has devastated the life of the typical Catholic parish. That what happened is, is that because it doesn't really matter if you're Catholic, parishes act like it doesn't matter if you're Catholic. Right. And so they, they've they changed in their mission. And so the, the mission of a parish in 1920, for example, is very different than one in 2020. And yeah. so it really goes through a history of what the church has taught about other religions and if they're salvific and, and what, why it matters to be mm -hmm. Catholic, all that, how that's changed over the past 50 or 60 years. And but, so I go through that, but then more importantly, then I apply it to how has that changed the life of just your average Catholic who goes to his parish down the street? How is that different than the average Catholic who went to his parish down the street in, let's say, 1920? Right. Cool. cool. And it's coming out probably the end of the year. Awesome. I hope so. Cool. Thank, thanks, Eric, so much for joining us and yep. giving us yeah, your words of yep. wisdom. Uh, so once again, Kennedy is coming out with his book, Terror of Demons, Reclaiming Traditional Catholic Masculinity, very soon in a print copy. Everyone who is a St. Athanasius patron of Meaning of Catholic or higher 
you'll get this book for free as well. Um, you go to patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic to support the work we do here. Meaning of Catholic is an apostolate dedicated to uniting Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church. That is our mission to unite Catholics together against the forces of evil that are currently gripping Vatican and the church at large. Uh, so that's what we do here. So I um, wanted to thank everybody for watching. Please share this video. Um, comment, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, Kennedy, do you uh, you want to share any further things on your book or anything you want to final words? Uh, no, that's good. I mean, what, what we're just going to do a series. <laughs> well, I mean, we're going to do a series of these shows on on t topics that pertain to being a good man, to being a masculine man. Um, so it's not all just weightlifting and cigars, which is important. Um, but it's also, but most importantly, you got to sort out your household and stuff. So stay tuned for more of that stuff. And and we're going to tease out topics in the book and episodes like this. Yeah, so we'll, yeah, the next one is, in fact, uh, strength training and, and physical and spiritual strength. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, we'll have to get to the cigars as well in the future. Cool. Uh, all right, cool. So let's pray in our Father. Let's pray for all the sick and dying, especially. Pray for our Holy Father, all the clerics, um, corrupt or faithful, whoever they may be, all of our families and all of your intentions, you who are watching. Let's pray in our Father. In the name of the Father, Son. Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And there's not temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.